Oh, thank you very much. Fantastic to be here, you guys. Look great. Thanks for coming to listen to my little story. And um, it's after lunch, so I'm feeling a little bit tired. I'm sure some of you people are too. So what I'd like to do is get a little energy in this room, and I'd like to do it by thanking all those people that made today so wonderful. So come on, give it up for everybody. Punch it in. Yeah, that's better. Thank you very much. Also, there are two guys sitting up in that booth, Guy and Paul. They've been looking at the back of your heads for a couple of hours. Turn around and just give them a little bit of a wave. Hey, Paul. Hey, Guy. These are the guys that make the stuff that I do so possible. So thanks, for, um, thanks again. I'm going to start with a question. How many people here live in a house that gets clean energy from a rooftop array of solar cells? That's very good. That's very good. How many people of that group are quite proud of the fact that they haven't had an electricity bill in the last couple of years? You smug bastards. <laughs> I'm one too. And uh, I don't like being smug about, smug about it, <clears throat> pardon me, but sometimes you really can't help it. And I was at a barbecue the other day, and I was standing around with a group of people, and they were talking about the homes, as you do. And then somebody mentioned they just got their power bill and it was gone up. And then there was five minutes of back and forth tirades, four letter words. And I was really trying to be concerned. I was trying to look sympathetic, but it just wasn't working. And finally, though, somebody, one of my friends knew me, turned to me and said, Hey, wait a minute, you've got a, uh, you've got a solar system. How much do you pay? And I said, Nothing. And, and one of them said, You're kidding. And I said, Yes, I am. Actually, they pay me. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> And then I looked up and I saw that classic Australian look that says, nobody likes a smart ass. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you have a solar system today, well, actually, I've, what I meant to say was last week an amazing thing happened. The one millionth solar system was connected to a grid in Australia. That's one million. Uh, that means, yeah, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> That means if you have a solar system, you're one of one in 10 homes in Australia that has one, and you've got a small solar power station that's part of a much greater solar power station. It's actually the size of three coal-fired power stations all sprinkled around Australia. As recently as 1994, however, there weren't any. Now think about that. If you had invested $1,000 in 1994, and it grew at the same rate as solar installations, today you'd be a millionaire. Oh, sorry, wait, did I say millionaire? You'd be a billionaire. That's right, you'd have a billion dollars. And hopefully you wouldn't spend it on putting dinosaurs on a beach and cool them. <laughs> yeah. Really, Clive, dinosaurs? Monuments to the animals that gave us fossil fuels. <laughs> anyway, I'm here to tell you today the story about that first grid-connected solar house, and it's a project that I call... Oh. Hey, guys, back to the beginning. No. Hold on, I'll go back, I'll go back. Oh, sorry, that was my fault. I forgot to put that one up. Here we go. It's a project that I call Solar One. And yes, I know, it's very creative. I was having a bad day, but that's the best word I could come up with for that. The project actually started a couple of years before 1994. I was working as a journalist. I was writing articles for the Australian and New Zealand, uh, sorry, the Australian uh, Computers and High Technology section. Um, and I was also working as a media officer for the Australian and New Zealand Solar Energy Society, which was a professional group of scientists, engineers, and a couple of rat bags like me trying to promote renewable energy. I'd been working in the solar field off and on for a couple of years at that point, um, and writing these kind of articles. I was actually able to get a few of them in where most papers wouldn't take this. I had a very good editor for that. And during a trip to the United States and to Japan one year, I think it was 1991, I came across a, a series of projects that had these uh, solar cells connected into the power grid. In, including one in Arizona, 29 homes in a subdivision. So I came back to Australia, and I found, to my surprise, that it hadn't been done here. And I'd wanted to build a state-of-the-art solar home using all the information that I'd known, so I thought, maybe this could be my house. So I cold-called Tony Booth, who was the head of research at the Southeast Queensland Electricity Board, called CQEB, and it's now Energex. 
And it was 1994, so I fully expected a secretary answer, but I got uh, this male voice that said, hi, Tony Booth here. I was a bit flabbergasted, but managed to explain who I was and what I'd seen, and asked him if uh, he thought Sequeb might be interested in a project of that type to connect the first solar array into a power grid. And to his great credit, he said, sounds interesting, come down to Brisbane and we'll talk about it. And that's what I did. <clears throat> a couple of weeks later, <clears throat> pardon me, I was in a meeting with Tony and a young engineer named Graydon Johnson who wanted to do a PhD on something more interesting than he could find at the time in the electricity industry. So we, uh, we hatched this idea to, to have a technical project to do this. And then a couple weeks later, I went to the Solar Energy Society's conference in Darwin, and I pitched them on being part of this as a promotional project. They put some money into funding the solar array. We'd run it for two years as a demonstration, and in my mind, it was a no-brainer. And to their great credit, they agreed to that unanimously. At that point, I called up my brother, who was a stockbroker in the United States at the time, and I said, hey, Doug, I'm going to build the first grid-connected solar home in Australia. And there was this very pregnant pause, and finally said, hey, Pete, we have an expression in stockbroking business. First one, all the foxhole gets shot. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, just like new parents, naive. Nah, it's not going to happen to me. I've got the solar society and utility behind me. What I was later to learn, and it's a very valuable lesson, is that when you charge out of that foxhole, sometimes the bullets come from behind you. And sometimes they're even aimed at your back. Well, nonetheless, I decided to continue, and I actually got access to this, this uh, high-end Com um, computer design architectural software at the University of Queensland. And I spent four weeks beavering away in this basement coming up with designs and after, after probably 120 hours I produced this stunning drawing. <laughs> hey man, state of the art in 1994. You know, we've come a little ways. I actually, well, that, was, uh, that was able for me to attract a really good architect, a guy named Mark Thompson. And we, uh, he proceeded to design a really lovely building. We found a site on the northern side of Mount Coulomb and began the preparation. It was a bit of a steep site and that, had, that was both a blessing and a curse. And then we started construction and we used a centuries old building technology called rammed earth. Uh, and we used that for the core of the house so that we had the thermal mass to keep it cool in the summer and keep it warm in the winter. A couple months down the track we got a bit further and we were absolutely now able to install the PV system that's me on the left and Graydon in the middle. And here we are up on the roof. Now, have a look at the advanced safety gear around my waist. <laughs> that picture's got my smile on my face, but just after that picture, everything started to go pear-shaped. The Solar Energy Society decided that they really didn't want to put money into a project where they thought there was a personal benefit to somebody. And even the South Australian, somebody in the, in the South Australian group wrote and said that it was too early to promote solar PV because it was too expensive. The array was going to cost in today's dollars about $30,000, but we got a company to give it to us for $15,000, but the Solar Society still didn't want to do that. So very quickly, I found myself running out of money, and a couple of things happened on the site, and it was this bad downward spiral, and I got to a point. I got to that point, maybe some of you people know that point, where you think, yeah, I could just get on my motorcycle or get in my car, and I could just drive out of here and leave it all behind. And then I learned another very valuable lesson. When you start on something and you put your heart and soul into it, help comes from the most unlikely directions. Not a day after I had those thoughts, I got a call from a guy named Richard Open, and he said, oh yeah, I read your article in the Solar Magazine, and you, were, you said you were looking for somebody to invest in your, in your solar house. Well, I'm retired and I have some money. How much do you need? So here's the kicker. Not only did he loan me the money to finish the project, he said, don't worry about the interest and just pay back the principal when you can. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll do that. So I carried on, we finished the building. And it is absolutely, it was a, a beautiful building. Um, there's a couple of aerial shots of it you, you'll be able to see. And the inside had this incredible feeling to it by virtue of the rammed earth. Everybody who came in said, man, this building just feels so good. We had, uh, these are 83-watt solar med modules. <clears throat> you can now buy them. They're 300 watts. We had solar water heating. This was the first ever inverter um, made in Australia. 
we had gas cooking, and we had efficient appliances, and that meant that this house only used about a quarter of the electricity the conventional house used. So uh, we uh, kept going on. Here's a couple of sorry. Here's a couple of pictures of the interior uh, from the loft area there, and then the kitchen. We tried to use uh, as low impact building materials wherever we could, and local materials. That's my downstairs office area. It was fantastic to work in. And that's one of the private bedroom areas. So the project was officially launched in June 1994 by the minister McCready. And over the next two years, it did everything it was supposed to do. It got some media attention. Uh, it was monitored. The solar system worked extremely well. Uh, nothing actually w went very wrong. Um, and we even, as part of this, um, uh, developed the first electricity purchase network agreement. And this is the agreement that the, if you have a solar system, you have to sign one of these. The ones today are three times as thick as that one. And I just want to point out something here. If you can see, it's 9.1, I think 9.3 cents a kilowatt hour was my feed-in tariff. In today's dollars, that's about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. If you go to install a system today, you're going to get 8 cents a kilowatt hour. So back then, the rate was almost three times what you can currently get at the moment. However, I did get something very special. Oh, I left it backstage. I did get something very special, uh, and that was the first check ever issued to a homeowner for solar PV, the amazing sum of $7. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, <laughs> seven bucks. However, the last check I got was for $1,000. Anyway, um, the project also did this amazing thing, and this is what the engineer wrote at the end. It's really good for the network, but it's taken 20 years for the network operators to realize this. They just haven't been able, haven't been able to do it. Now, not everybody was uh, enamored with my project. Um, towards the end of the construction, uh, I was standing uh, on the roof with uh, one of the chippies and looking across, and he looked at me and he said, this will never catch on. <laughs> of course, to be fair, it was a couple days after I crashed his truck. <laughs> and funny thing about living on a hill and not setting the, the handbrake, you know? <laughs> so, uh, in the end, I sold the house after a couple of years. It was bought by a, uh, a couple and then bought by another guy. I went back there a couple of months ago. It's still operating fine, but the inverter... After 18 years failed, that was the first ever one made. I reckon that's not too bad. And, um, uh, and I have to say that there were a lot of people involved in this. Got help from a lot of different areas. But seen in the arc of history, I think Solar One was a really modest effort by a group of curious and committed individuals. It wasn't particularly original, and it wasn't even very technically challenging. The solar part was actually quite easy. But... It was that proverbial first step on the road to what's become a very twisty uh, path to a clean energy future. And I'd like to think, in its small way, it just twisted slightly that cork of the bottle holding in the clean energy genie. And that genie now, with a million homes out there, she ain't going back no way <laughs> unless somebody puts her back there. And I can tell you, there are a lot of people who would love to put that solar genie back in the bottle. So, this begs the question, what can we do? It's a couple of things. First, the theme of this event is catalyst for change. But a catalyst is something that speeds up or slows down a reaction without actually taking part in the reaction. Clearly then, we have to be more than catalysts. We actually have to be the change. Now, we can get some inspiration, I think, from Albert Einstein, who a century ago said, imagination is more important than knowledge. We have all the knowledge we need. At some point, we have to imagine ourselves living in a society 100% powered by renewable energy. And for some reason, most of our politicians and most of our industry leaders just cannot see this future. It's kind of a case of no one's quite so blind as one who refuses to see. But we know it's possible, and a study last week done by an excellent researcher named Mark Diesendorf took data from the national electricity market 
and analyzed it over 20 years, putting in different amounts of renewable energy. And he found that after 20 years, we could have an economy where the, all the electricity comes from renewable energy sources, and we could have it at a price to seven to $10 billion more than what we're currently paying. Hmm, where to get the seven to $10 billion? Let me think. Parking fines? No, it's not gonna do it. Uh, oh, wait a minute, I know. How about the $10 billion a year we're already paying to the highly profitable and very polluting fossil fuel industries? That would cover it for sure. <laughs> so, this brings me up to an <clears throat> my final point. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's about money. It's the lifeblood of any industry. How many people here have uh, superannuation or some other types of investments? How many people here know for sure that none of those are investments are in fossil fuels? Good. How many people know for sure that those are investments are in clean energy? That, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest, is most of the problem and most of the solution. Now, a couple of years ago, I got a chance to, to try out some ideas in this regard. You may remember there was a very generous rebate for solar systems, and I put together a bulk buy for some friends but I found that a number of friends couldn't afford the upfront cost. So I went to, I talked with the local company, Ozion, who's up in the Innovation Alley, and with another friend of mine, we used our superannuation fund to loan money to Ozion so they could install the systems, and then we would be, would be repaid by the rebates that, rebates that were coming back. <clears throat> We've th kept that going in various different forms over the last four years, and we finance now the total of about 3,000 one kilowatt systems. And we've made a pretty good profit. So let me ask my final question. How many here believe that we could get all of our electricity from renewable energy sources in the next 20 years? I can tell you from my experience that it's not going to be easy, but it's not that hard either. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. All the best.